The HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is powered by Gornerstone Gundog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your seven-week-old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for the free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. <laughs> Since 1898, Old Town has been building the most advanced, quality watercraft products to give you the very best experience on the water. Whether you're hunting, fishing, or enjoying a relaxing paddle on the lake, there's a boat for every type of adventurer. If you haven't seen it, check out their newest offering, the new grab-and-go watercraft designed to function as your boat, blind, and retriever. The easy-to-conceal, 11-foot, 9-inch, 56-pound, solo sportsman is the ideal craft for those in search of a stable, lightweight craft that's easy to paddle and even easier to transport or stash. Designed with the hunter and angler in mind, the Solo Sportsman is equipped with thoughtful shell, tackle, and tool storage, a comfortable and adjustable seat and foot braces, an accessory track, and rod holders. Check it out at oldtownscanoe.com forward slash sportsman. Out in the field, how you've prepared determines how you'll perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak condition, Yukonuba Premium Performance Dog Food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, ready for anything, that's a Yukonuba dog. Gunner kennels are engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 kennel has set a new industry standard and put Gunner in a category all its own. They were started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the center of everything that they do. Gunner is dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at Gunner.com. Lifetime Decoys' new Flex Float Mallard decoys set the new standard for quality and durability in waterfowl decoys. An EVA foam, open bottom construction combined with patent-pended dual-flow swim keel system allows for more movement and less wind, the ability to sit flat on ice and dirt, and virtually indestructible design which can be shot or otherwise punctured and still float. Each decoy weighs only 11 ounces with the self-riding keel weights removed or 19 ounces with the weights installed. Check them out today at lifetimedecoys.com. All right, welcome to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 179. Where you're on demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. Check us out, hpoutdoors.com. You can find our podcast on all the quality podcast directories out there iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, or Spotify, wherever you find your podcast content, you can find our show. You can head over to social media, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you are into uh, Facebook groups, you can head over to ours and chat with a bunch of like minded hunters. And my co host, Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up, man? And I can see that you have some nice flow going, and I just couldn't handle the COVID hair any longer, so I had to self-mutilate my hair, and uh, is what it is, but good to see no you. Cut, no cut till a cure, bro. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we're, excited to be, we're excited to be live in the group this week, and we are excited to be joined by a guest who I'm going to bring on here right now, Dan, so stand by. We're excited to be joined by Josh Parvin of Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Josh, what's up, man? How's it going? Excited to be on here. Appreciate you guys for bringing me on. Yeah, man. We're excited to have you, and we're looking forward to chatting hunting dogs. And, you know, anytime we talk dog training, it's one of the most uh, popular topics that we get into. You know, those episodes always get tons of views and tons of likes and questions and stuff like that. So, we're pumped to be able to have you in the group with us this evening and kind of take questions while we, while we talk, because no matter what, every time we do a dog training episode, we always get the, Hey, um, you know, can you ask this? Or, you know, I would have wished you would ask this or whatever it was. So, uh, we started doing this kind of format so that like, if we're missing that, you know, something's going on, we got it. We got it covered. So, uh, you know, we've had Barton on the show, half dozen times or so maybe more over the years uh it's the first time having you on the program so maybe we can start off by just letting you talk a little bit about your background sort of how you got into gun dog training all that kind of stuff and just sort of uh give us a little baseline of kind of where you're coming from yeah i would uh i'd love to share that so really my story i feel like 
my story is similar to a lot of people's. You get into gun dogs because you love hunting. Uh, not everybody does, but a lot of people do. That's what attracts us to it. But if you go way back, I've always loved outdoors. I've always been involved with hunting. My dad got me involved at an early age, probably. I was four or five on my first deer hunt. Couldn't even look over the shooting house window, but he got me, set me up in his lap. I could look out and I would see the deer out in the field. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Uh, and then, so we, we hunted deer for a long time, but, uh, as we kind of, as I grew older and started hunting on my own, that kind of the fun wasn't quite there as much. Of course, we love deer hunting, whitetail hunting, but it's not the same when you're not, you know, making those connections. So that's when we started branching out and trying different huntings, uh, such as waterfowl. We, we had a lot of people at our church telling us about waterfowl hunting and they said, you know, you've got to try it. And we're thinking, you know, that's not going to be. You know, for, as a deer hunter, we're thinking, no, that's not going to be that good. We're going to be freezing. But we went out there on our first waterfowl hunt, and I wasn't cold at all. In fact, <laughs> never looked back after that. That is what, that's kind of what transitioned us into the gun dogs because when we were out there on our first hunt, it was a, there was this one really incredible dog in that blind. And uh, we were terrible shots. It was all new hunters out there. So we were, we were only barely hitting them. And that dog did, I can't tell you how many four or 500 yard retrieves that dog did that day <laughs> but it uh it was it was impressive so that, that kind of set a spark inside that led us down led us down that path and that's so that's kind of a little bit of my background and but it started with the roots of, of deer hunting but it led straight to waterfowl hunting so where are you located at now i am uh just in gardendale alabama so i've always been in the birmingham alabama area but uh, currently i live right in gardendale alabama so fairly warm and and josh if you don't mind i'm gonna pull one of uh manini's questions out and okay. we'll just get right into it man you know right Let's here. Do it. you know how and we'll throw it up there how do you I'm beat sure, the heat it's already that, hot yeah. it's already hot as can be here in arizona so any outside stuff is hard to do unless it's under the stars due to the work schedule so how are you, how are you, you know, and it's really, what is it, May here, so it's not, I mean, I it's guess hot. in Arizona, it's <laughs> super hot. It's hot, it's hot where you're at, so, you it's know, how hot. do you go about it and keep the dog safe? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, the heat, that's a tough thing, it's tough for us, it's tough for the dog. Uh, it really comes down to just trying to train at times that you can manage the heat. You know, I wouldn't be training out in the middle of the day here. I don't do that. It's just going to be too hot. Anytime it gets above 80, especially with the humidity here in Alabama, it'll suck it out of you. And the dogs, they're done after a few retrieves. So yeah. I either get up really early or really late. Or if, let's say if you're in that situation and you, let's say your work schedule is saying, hey, I can only train, you know, in the early afternoon. Well, in that case, you may just want to limit your training and do a few retrieves and then let your dog rest basically work on place work or extended place or kind of like you do when you're sitting there hunting i mean the birds aren't always coming in so you can never train enough on just sitting down hanging out with your dog and then let them rest let them get their energy back up make sure it's not too hot then give them a couple more retrieves and then keep them cool try to work in the shade if you can but uh now, the heat is tough as something that I do not look forward to when it comes to training dogs. And if you work with it, if you're patient, you can definitely, you know, make the most of it at least. Let me ask a question now that I'm, I'm thinking about this because, you know, it's hot here. It's May, right? Like it's warming up in a lot of places in the country. And, you know, I live in Virginia and when um, September starts, um, we, you know, we start hunting early geese and it's hot. I mean, it's, it's hot during the day. Um, most people think about protecting their dog from, from cold when, <clears throat> um, the, when they're hunting, could they, is there, is, is heat hunting in, in September like that a concern or is there enough downtime between flights and stuff where it's not as big of a deal? You know, that all, that all depends on, you know, how many birds are coming in, but let's say you get covered up, you know, if you're covered up, you might want to. You let your dog rest. It just depends. I, for me, I'm going to be reading my dog's body language. I'm going to be paying attention to that and kind of seeing, you know, where they stand on everything. And if they're just, you know, their tongue's hanging out, they're laying down like they're all tired, then I probably will let them rest and we'll go out and pick the bird. So it really comes down to just reading your dog's body language. But if you, you know, a lot of dogs actually 
you know, die of heat stroke or, or get severely injured by it. So you have to be careful. Um, you know, for me, it's just a matter of, you know, I look at them, I, I get a feel for, hey, if this dog, if I feel like it can do it, I'll do it. And some dogs, you have to be careful. They have so much drive, so much desire that they'll go and they'll just keep going. So you have to really pay attention to how your dog's doing it. If they get a little too hot, it could be dangerous. So never, you know, always err on the safe side for sure. And let me let me compound on the water as far as drinking is concerned. When you're out training, do you have any water with you or are you letting them take any breaks? And the reason, yay or nay? Really good question. Um, I'm very cautious of that. You know, a lot of times I've never experienced this, but I've heard of it. You know, a lot of people, they work their dog real hard and they let it go get water. And sometimes they're fine, but I've heard of a lot of, you know, that's a possibility. And I don't, I don't know about this for sure, but I've heard of it happening where it turns their stomach and it can be dangerous. So for me, I don't, uh, I actually don't have a lot of water out there. I might just get a water bottle and give them a couple of palmfuls, not a lot, just a little. And then what I do is I come back home. I let my dogs rest. I let them lay down for about an hour. Then I get them out. Then I give them some water. So I'm always very cautious if I'm working them, especially doing lots of retrieves, working them hard. I never feed them or water them right after. I always give them a little bit of time to rest, about an hour, somewhere in there. Cool. Um, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump to a question. We've we've got uh, several coming in here, so I'm going to pull one in. It's a little bit longer, so I'll try to read through this in case it. Uh, uh, doesn't hit the screen here, but basically it says if you have a lab that's a year old and get some energy uh, and spark from the clicker uh, and treat and he does uh, retrieves but doesn't seem to learn nearly as quickly with retrieves as the reward, what would you do? So basically it looks like we're, you know, it's, it's a patience thing. So whenever you transition to new skills, and it's a good question, it actually kind of applies to a lot of areas of your training no matter what whether it's the retrieve but specifically in this question in other areas if you try something new with your dog and they're not necessarily responding as good to something that they had before that's okay the dogs are probably just processing and just trying to figure out hey what's going on here this is new because up until this point maybe you've gotten to a groove with your dog it's loving the quick clicker and treat as doing really good it's got a good feel for it but then you bring out retrieves maybe you haven't been retrieving yet and all of a sudden, the dog's thinking, okay, this is different, and it's trying to figure everything out. That's a good chance just to, for you as a handler to be patient, and as you're training your dog, be patient and realize, okay, I've just introduced my dog to something new. So it's going to obviously take some time to work through it with them because they have to figure out what's required of them. And that's that's a huge thing as far as you know that specific topic, but you could basically blanket that over all of dog training. Anytime you introduce something new, definitely be patient with your dog. But um as far yeah, as the retreat, go ahead. I was actually going to ask that real quick. I, I mean, dog training uh, to me would be one of the things where you got, you know, requires an incredible amount of patience. And I'm curious how, what you think about this. Like, you know, with social media and stuff today, you see like, you know, just dogs that are just hard charging, stopping on the way, you know, doing everything perfectly. And then you get guy who's like weekend dude, who just training when he's got some time and you know, they're struggling to get to that point. And I could see frustration boiling in really quickly. Um, and it almost feels like if you remember back in the day when like monster buck videos were like the jam, right? Everybody thought they were going to roll out on the little ground and shoot a 180 because they did it 30 times on the video. Right. And that's just not reality. So I'm curious, like, how often does that come up where people are like, man, I'm really struggling with all of this stuff and you don't necessarily have the magic bullet. It's like, you just got to be patient and you got to continue to work through it. It's, it's all the time. And honestly, I would say, at least for me, I, I know uh, a lot of other professionals I've talked to, even, even for professionals, I mean, that, that happens, you, you know, you've done it a lot, but you keep working with a new dog and then all of a sudden, it's just not happening as quick and it can be easy to get frustrated, but frustration is going to slow your progress even more. So it's kind of, it really, you know, you might be getting frustrated because it's not going as quick as you would like it, but that's actually going to slow your progress down even more. But 100%, uh, just just the, the, the amount of work and the amount of repetition it takes to get your dog to be successful in all arenas is just unimaginable it's way more than you would think so you could be knocking something out with your dog uh, you could be doing all obedience you could be into retrieves you could even be into whistle work and all kinds of um, more advanced skills 
and then you go and you move to new lo- training locations and it's all of a sudden your dog is reverted back to like three months before when it was just getting into taking lines and that is something that boils down to just reps and basically going back to the fundamentals it all all training is going to boil back down to the the fundamentals if you focus on them then you're good to go but nonetheless frustration still comes in i would say for me i think everyone can relate to that Mm -hmm. Uh, and for me i I always try to take my own advice. I don't always take my own advice, but anytime I get frustrated, I try to step back from the situation and figure out, hey, you know, what is going on? Is the dog just doing it, doing this because it's just choosing to be disobedient, or is it not sure? <laughs> is there a new smell out there? Maybe a deer walked by before we came out, and you never know. All, there's so many different variables that could go into it. So I try to be as least frustrated as possible, uh, but. I, for everybody, I would say for professionals or for the person that's doing their first dog, guarantee it, you're going to feel like your dog should be moving a lot faster than it is. I have a question. You know, we talk about us having patience, but when, and I don't know when, uh, how old Nicholas's dog is, but when do you get away from the clicker and then you really know that that, you know, the retrieve is the reward? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And um, as far as I'll answer that, but also think while we're talking about the clicker, let's talk a little bit about that because I know some might not really know what the clicker is or might not be familiar with it. So I think that would be a good thing to mention next. But really kind of getting away from it, I like to really transition away from the clicker when I when I've really laid down the foundation very well. So I've already done basic obedience. I've done intermediate and advanced obedience, and I've started the process of teaching my dog how to retrieve, because it's kind of it's a blended process. So you, it's not you're not going to quit cold turkey. You're not just going to say, okay, I'm done using the clicker and treat, you know, one day. It's going to be a slow process, and what's actually called variable reinforcement. But to make it very simple, basically, instead of clicking and treating a lot and consistently, you're actually just starting to fade that out less and less. So essentially your dog doesn't know when they're going to get rewarded. So that's what you kind of do leading up to when you start rolling into the retrieves and teaching your dog how to retrieve. Then you start teaching your dog how to retrieve. And then obviously as you're going through that process, you start trading the reward for the actual retrieve itself. And eventually you can kind of bleed that out. I always do keep the clicker in my back pocket though. You never know when you're going to need it. If you ever need to sharpen up your dog's obedience, you can absolutely do that or work through a problem area. But It really is going to, it's a slow process that kind of just blends together. So it's, there's no like defined moment that you're done with the clicker and treat. It's, will your dog perform without the clicker and treats? And again, the way you get to that is through variable reinforcing or reinforcing every other time or every five times out of 10 or every two times out of 10 until eventually you don't have to do it anymore. Uh, And then again, you transition into the retrieve. And once you get to the retrieves and you're, it clicks, and most dogs, once you get to the retrieves, are pretty excited about it. So they're generally even more interested in you know, retrieving than they are even so than the treats. Mm, wow. Uh, so, you know, this, a lot of questions we, you know, I'm sure that you get are like guys that either uh, just bought a puppy or they're preparing to buy a puppy and they're like trying to figure out what they're going to do and how their training approach is going to be and, and all that good stuff. But uh, guy from the group art here has a, a good question that I think is valid because his question actually deals with the dog. That's not a puppy and it's um, a little bit older. And I think a lot of guys, you know, like me, for example, I, I didn't start hunting until, um, a little bit later in life and I already had a dog and I was like, well, he's probably too old to really like get into it at this point, And he's too prone to ear infections anyway. So I, I let him <laughs> stay at home. Um, but I mean, a lot of guys probably want to try to sharpen up or, or, or see if they can get their older dog to a level where they can enjoy some time in the field. So I'll, we'll bring Art's question in here and see what you think about this. Um, basically Art says his dog's three and retrieves, but he has no direction unless he throws a rock or he actually sees the bird. And he's wondering if he can correct that with him being, uh, you know, at that age. And is that something that they can overcome? Excellent, excellent question. And actually, you know, we get a lot of people that come to us in in that exact same situation. So some come with puppies, some come with two or three year old dogs. You know, there's you hear the saying, hey, dogs, uh, you know, can be too old to learn new tricks. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You can teach an old dog new tricks if you want to. Uh, And I wouldn't consider a three year old dog um, old, but it's still pretty young. It still has a lot to learn. Uh, And you can definitely work with it. I will say, as you get to that 
one year plus and you get into the two to three year age range, even four years old, what you're going to have to work with is maybe some habits that are already already ingrained. You know, we talked about repetition a minute ago and how much it takes, you know, an unbelievable amount. Well, every single day you have your dog, it's being, it's repeating things. And there's some things that you might not be paying attention to. Maybe you just got into hunting and, you know, up until this point, throwing rocks in a direction was good with you. Um, but you really started looking into dogs and you think, hey, I would like my dog to actually be able to take hand signals. Well, if you've been throwing rocks for, for two years straight, you've got a lot of repetition, a lot of ingrained habits that you'll have to work through with that specific dog. So just with that in mind, it may take a little longer to get your dog to the level that you want it to, especially handling. But even with a three-year-old dog, I mean, you, as long as you've got the fundamental base down, you can start teaching it to take hand signals if you want. Uh, there's no, no problem with that. Just realize, again, with a little bit of an older dog, it may take a little longer, uh, mainly just because it's got other things that you'll have to train through, some things that it's more comfortable with or that it's just used to doing. So um, definitely with a little bit of an older dog, you could absolutely, absolutely work with it. It just may take a little extra work than starting with a puppy that's brand new and basically a brand new piece of clay ready to be molded however you want it to be. So with your response, I'm just thinking, would it be easier to for him to have someone helping him and, and like actually stand where a location is and, you know, line them up properly? Is that like a, a step that he should take? Um, I would probably, I would always go back to the basics. So I would make sure, you know, even with that, that dog, a lot of people, and I'm saying this because I, I talk to people every single day that come with similar situations. And I would say, make sure you've covered your obedience first. Make sure you've covered all that. Uh, Cause a lot of times that's not actually where it needs to be. But once you've got that, let's say you want to start teaching those, those hand signals. I would go, uh, I would teach, I wouldn't have someone sitting out there. I would teach the hand signals individually. So you're just going to basically put a bumper out to its right or put a bumper out to its left or a bumper back behind it. Uh, you're going to want to utilize a fence for this because if you think about it, you need your dog to be able to run up against something, something to pull your dog to where the bumper is. And then you can start teaching your dog the hand signals individually. Then what you would do is you would start combining those hand signals together. And then eventually you could start branching out from there and teaching your dog to do hand signals when it's not basically on a blind type retrieve, if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah, I think there's some there's some times you're hunting in some timber and you don't have rocks. It'd be hard to start breaking some limbs <laughs> off and throwing them out in the water. But well, I've yeah, seen uh, uh, I've seen I've seen people throwing rocks and smack their hand on a screw on the top of the blind, and then there's blood everywhere. So it's it's not that fun if that happens. And uh, like you said too, the uh, distance is going to eventually become an issue. Even if you have a slingshot, some of those birds they go too far. So you need to be able to have it under that tight control. Yeah. So, um, there's another question in the group that I, that I do want to get to, cause I think it's a good one and it comes up a lot, but before we do that, I want to talk just briefly here about, um, you know, cornerstone gun dog Academy and, you know, let people know, um, you know, like the logo on your hat with the 52 and stuff. Um, one of the biggest questions that I see in our group and I see it, uh, if not once a week, it's, it's, it may be more frequently than that is people want to know about cornerstone. You know, you hear the is it worth it? Like, is it good? Like, you know, will I, can I use it? Right. I mean, like, these are all questions because as we talked about, someone's buying a puppy and a puppy is a significant financial investment. And, you know, if they want to put that dog on the best path, uh, you know, for training and they're considering cornerstone, they've got questions, right. And let's assume that that person doesn't have an extensive background or maybe any background in gun dog training. Um, that, that is, and, and as far as I understand it, that, that is really the, one of the biggest benefits of, of cornerstone is it will teach you that sort of crawl, rock, crawl, walk, run sort of approach so that you can do it yourself. Um, but as someone who knows the program as well as anybody, just tell us a little bit about, you know, when a guy's exploring his options on gun dog training, um, you know, what is it that cornerstone brings to the table that's, you know, going to put them off in the right path? Yeah. So I think that's a really, a really great question, and uh, it's hard to begin on that one. I mean, first of all, just beyond just the actual program itself, I mean, we care a lot about the people that come to the table, and for good reason. It comes down to your story specifically, whoever you are, that wherever you're at, I mean, we understand you know, that feeling, especially for the person that's coming 
it's even brand new to hunting and dogs, let alone, you know, it can feel very overwhelming. There is zero question about that. Even now, if you've been in hunting forever, you've seen great dogs, you hear all the stories about how, you know, how someone got their dog to where it is, it can feel like, I don't know if that's even possible uh, for me, somebody that's brand new at it, you know, anybody in that situation. And, you know, for us, again, it boils back down to the individual and their journey. And we're all about helping someone have that dog because if you get beyond where you're at, let's say maybe you're sitting there in a situation where, you know, you're thinking about it, but you're not sure if you if you should attempt to do this. Because like you said, Josh, it is an investment. So you, you want to make sure you get the most out of your investment. Let's see. Let's just say you're sitting there thinking, you know, can I do this? Is this something worth attempting. And I, I would think, if I were you, I would think about the end goal. Think about how good it's going to be because we know what it's like to have trained your own dog. We know what it's like to have seen tons of people use our program and train their own dog and accomplish that. And it's a huge accomplishment to train your own dog and get it to a level to when you go out there and you're hunting, it's a joy to be with. And you get invited back to the blind because, hey, everybody liked hunting with your dog and went out and got the birds. And I would say, just the initial feelings of, you know, can I do this? Is it worth it? Am I going to be able to accomplish this? I would say, you know, put all that out of your mind and think about, hey, where am I going? What is it going to be like when I get there? So just take it off the table. Can I do it? And just say, you know, I can do this and, and get after it. And that's kind of where our program comes in because we want to give you the framework to help you be able to do it. We want to give you the vehicle that you can, you know, turn the key on and drive it. Now, it's not going to – is you can't just buy the program and have a trained dog. It's You do have to drive the vehicle. You do have to put in the work to get there because it's, it is a lot of work. That's why they pay people so good to train dogs, and that's why people become great at it because it takes a lot of work, and not everybody wants to do that. But for the individual that wants to have that dog and that wants to put in the work and have that, that experience that no one can take from you, it's worth every every single bit of it. But as far as uh, the logo on the hat, the 52 plus, that is, uh, you know, that's kind of our next our next direction that we've been rolling with Cornerstone. Now, obviously, we, we're keeping our original program because it's incredible. Lots of great videos there, lots of great information. Someone can take that program, the Complete Gun Dog Academy, and they can work through it from start to finish and have an incredible gun dog that they can hunt with and be very happy with. But we've also had some reach out that just want even more. You know, we, we the questions we asked ourselves were we, you know, we have our Facebook group, we we talk to members a lot, and some just want even more. And we thought, hey, what would it be like if we could just be right there with you along the way? Because it's no it's no lie, it's no secret that you're gonna face challenges as you work with your dog. We talked about frustration earlier, and sometimes it boils down to your dog's just not quite there yet. It just needs a little more reps. But sometimes it boils down to a specific issue that if you were to try a different angle, you could easily get through it and move, make great, great advancement and great progress. So um, for the 52 plus, for those that want the most detail, that's kind of where, you know, where it's come from. And it's, there is no detail that is left out when it comes, when it comes to 52 plus. I mean, we literally are filming our journey of training a dog through the entire Complete Gun Dog Academy. We show you the mess ups all. Every mistake, every everything that goes right, everything that goes wrong, and we just show you the whole the whole journey. Yeah, it was it was really cool to see you know the cornerstone form and and everyone start going through it, and then you see the questions and you guys answer and answer and answer and answer, and then finally the fifty two plus came and that was you know so detailed in in every way, and that was with Violet, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's your. I had your dog. I tried to She's follow a good my chair oh, yeah. right there. If anybody saw that, <laughs> did you just break your chair? Well, I'm sitting on a white like lawn chair, like a legit like just redneck lawn chair. Gets caught up in the carpet a little bit when I'm trying to slide away from the the computer. So don't worry about that. <laughs> For people just listening, he literally just fell off the screen and came back real quick. But that was nice. <laughs> so what were what were we talking about again? I forget. <laughs> Oh, 52 plus. One thing that I that I enjoyed seeing too, um, with Cornerstone, you had a lot of first time trainers come on, and you did like spotlights on them, and and they actually told their story, and so it just goes back to what you're saying. You know, if you are dedicated to it, and even you know, going back to uh, Mo Marine Hitchens, right? So mm -hmm. she's a uh, you know Aaron's mom. 
Yeah, name dropping, Josh. I'm sorry, but you know <laughs> she was that was it. the first dog she ever trained, right? And and that dog's doing awesome. So, yeah. um, I'm sure a little help from Aaron along the way, but you know it's just cool, and and it really is something that's easy to follow. And then you guys are always at the other end of the line when when there are questions. So, you know, kudos to you guys on on all of that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I I wanted to jump into another one of these questions um, with you because. Um, again, I'm not, my dog, like I said, my dog is a 90 pound golden retriever that just loves nothing more than getting ear infections and chewing on his paws. So he's not a hunting dog. Uh, but so I, I, my, my level of education on, on retriever training is, is, is quite low, but one of the things I see come up a lot and it seems like it's a, uh, an, a topic that has a lot of different opinions to it, uh, is force fetching. And, uh, Nick, here's got another question. That's a good one, I think. And he asks, do you think is force fetching or hold conditioning a must for the weekend warrior type hunter? Well, either way, either way you're going to go 100%. I mean, if you're going to, even for a weekend warrior, uh, I mean, if you're getting after it, if you're training a dog and you're investing any amount of time, you need to be putting as much in as you can. And, you don't want to miss or skimp on that because if your dog will not hold, if your dog will not bring the bird back, or if your dog picks it up and then drops it and has to pick it up again and drop it, you're missing out on birds. And you know, for those that are more interested in hunting and just want to have the dog there with you just to help with the experience, you're missing out on birds because if your dog's out there flopping around the decoys trying to get the bird but can't get it back, I've seen it happen. And birds are coming in. Everybody's thinking, this dog needs to get in the blind right now because they're coming in and we need to be ready for them. And yeah. sometimes you miss them. So I would say absolutely you need to be teaching your dog how to retrieve the hand properly 100% whether whatever method you're, you're going at. It doesn't matter what method you're doing. You just need to make sure that you cover it and make sure that your dog comes on back and, and brings that bird back and doesn't drop it. Being the really bad trainer that I am, I have a lot of stories like that with, with Kimber, <laughs> all the stories. Kimber bringing Kimber bringing uh, wood ducks back uh, three at uh, the one the one story she brought it back three different times and <laughs> drop dropped it and the thing got right back in the water and took off. She and she's just looking at me like, "Come on!" I'm like, "Well, you're the one that dropped it. You know what do you want? What do you want me to do?" But um, you know, I did. I had a question for you. My my father in law. Um, working with with boo who is a southern oak kennels dog um he said i said you know we're talking to josh he's like i really like watching josh on on cornerstone so, <laughs> so props to you there but um <laughs> she said when when boo's boo's 100 yards out and she's hunting for the dummy she will not stop to a whistle and whenever she if she can't find it and finally kind of gives up then she will stop and turn around and look and and whatnot. So, what is what is he doing wrong, or what does he need to work on to make sure she's stopping when that whistle hits? Very good question. Um, you know, there's a couple of questions I'd have, but we probably can't get the answer right away. So I'll just give you a couple of scenarios. My first question would be, you know, will your dog stop at 50 yards, um, or 60 yards, or 70 yards? So it's a big thing. So the, the 100 yard mark, maybe the dog's not stopping there. Maybe it does perfect at, at 50 yards but you branched out to the 100 yards and it can't handle it. That's because the dog needs to be more slowly worked out to that distance. Uh, so for example, if your dog can crush it at 50, don't jump to 100. You know, Jump to 55 yards or to 60 yards. It's kind of a very slow progression to get your dog to where they stop. And if your dog's not stopping on the whistle, you know, don't keep blowing it because it's not – at that 100-yard mark, it's not going to do anything good to keep blowing that whistle. So, um, you know, if it, maybe the dog doesn't stop every single time. Maybe the dog stops a couple of times out at 100 yards, but this time it didn't, so it's kind of sporadic. It's all going to boil back down in, in this specific situation to the fundamentals and making sure that everything is perfectly covered. Make sure that you've worked your way out to that because – if you didn't do enough reps at 70 yards and didn't drill it in, you, you should get to the point to where if you blow the whistle, you have zero question if your dog is going to stop at whatever distance it is. If you can't make it to 100, that's okay. You know, Go to 20 yards, start at 20, and then work your way out to that 100. I, I mean, it is a lot of work, but I'll tell you this. Once you put that work in and once you've 
conditioned your dog into it, it's done. Your dog has it, and it's going to remember it. You know, if you do enough reps, your dog will not forget it. So I would say go back to the basics. Go back to uh, individual whistle stop when you're not actually specifically retrieving, but also transition into just some shorter retrieves and get success. You know, if, if you took away anything, whether you're using our program, whether you're using another program, if you set your dog up for success and you get it wins, that's going to be the best bet. That is always going to help you have the best dog possible. Even if you feel like your dog should be further along, if you feel like that dog should, hey, my dog should be doing that 100-yard whistle stop, no doubt. Even if you feel like that, it doesn't matter. You need to set it up. If it's not winning, you're, you're taking steps back. So make sure that you're making those wins. Even if you, it's a small victory, that's okay. It's you know, Training a dog is going to boil down to lots of small victories added up together to the whole grand finale of having that you know, champion gun dog that you've worked so hard for. There you go. So, Thad, when you're listening to this, reel it in, my friend. <laughs> reel it in. <laughs> so I, I, I sort of have a question about setting your dog up for success because, I mean, I think that rings true in a lot of things in life. I mean, for example – if I play golf once every two weeks or once a month, I should have no expectation of going out there and shooting par. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to be terrible uh, or I might, you know, I'm going to be inconsistent at least. And so I, I, you know, I assume that there needs to be some level of regularity and sort of, um, you know, rhythm to the training program to allow your dog to sort of understand, okay, it's time to work. Like these are, you know, our sessions, how that all goes. Um, what realistically can a guy do? What can he get away with? And I'm, it probably is a little bit dependent on the dog, but, um, you know, guys working full time or it's hot and you're limited, you know, summer, you got vacation, whatever, you know, you got think life going on. Um, if a guy's training once a week, should he have a expectation of a success or, uh, does it need to be more frequent than that? Like what's, what's kind of a general rule of thumb if there is one? Really, really good question. You know, if you're training once a week, and for some people that's all they have, yeah. you got to make the most of it. So, I'm all for making the most of what you do have, 100%. Because if you don't have four days, you only have one. You've only got one option, and so you better make the most of that one day. Uh, and maybe you train a lot in that one day. It is better to train more days per week. I would say a good average is three to four days per week if you have it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, one hour, two hour sessions. I mean. Any, anything over an hour, you already the dog's already going to be you know making some mistakes because that's a long time to pay attention. You know, even for us as individuals, that's a long time to pay attention. So, I would say, uh, as far as setting your dog up for success, if you're if you're on that one day a week training regimen, you know, don't go out there and just you know. For me, I like to get out and attack stuff. I like to just go out and do. And sometimes with that mentality. You know, sometimes I, I think I can do more than I can actually do in a certain period of time. So, you know, with that in mind, don't bite off more than you can chew. Just get out there. And I would say this, you know, every session is different. So if you're out there and you're working with your dog, you've got that one day a week and you've got a big plans and everything's going well. And then you hit one part of that plan that you have and then things just start going off the tracks. Don't don't be upset because that one small piece fell apart move to something that you're getting success at and be content with what you did have and then reevaluate when, when it's all over and figure out, okay, well, why did that go wrong? Was the dog just tired? Did I make a mistake? A lot of times, you know, a lot of times it's going to boil down to a handler mistake, maybe saying the wrong command. Uh, maybe uh, you have your, you're given hand signals and you pull up both of your hands and maybe your elbow flashes and the dog takes off. Whatever it is, it, it could be anything. But I would say definitely make the most of the time that you do have and try to, again, it's it's kind of a slow process. It's like baby steps. You just take one step at a time and branch your way out to get, if you want to have an advanced dog, it takes that time. It takes those small steps to success. And if you do small steps to success, you're good. You're going to trip. The dog's not going to do well. Some things aren't going to always mesh. And, that, and that's a big thing, I think, to understand is, Bad days aren't a bad thing. You're still making progress. It doesn't mean that you know every day is not going to go perfect. In fact, you're going to have a lot of rough training days or what feels rough because things didn't go as planned, and that's just part of it. And if you can manage that and you can handle through it and stay positive and stay focused, then you can absolutely get through it. But whether you're training one day or, or six days a week, just make the most of the time you have. Be creative. You can do a lot with a little bit of time. I'm just thinking, you know, with – with the handler's patience and the dog, you know, just being a dog, 
when when do you know you should just shut it down you know things aren't going right things are bad like before you blow up on the dog or you know or the dog is not having a good day you know and and I'm, you know they happen so when yeah. when do you suggest to just like all right let's pack it in and go sit in front of the tv for a minute or whatever you want to do you know it's uh, i guess it's probably different for every every person but um you know, I, I would say this, and, and really think about it. Dogs are incredible. They're so attentive. They can pick up small, little subtleties. I mean, you have service dogs that provide incredible services to people, uh, diabetic alert dogs. If you think about how in tune they are with how you're feeling, then that should tell you something. So your dog's going to sense that you're frustrated before you even know it. So if the dog starts uh, – getting you start things start going a little bit south and your frustration starts to rise you've got to either be able to manage your emotions or if you're not able to or something it just you've had a rough you know if you think about it a lot of people train when they get home from work and sometimes you know a lot of times work isn't as is a great as dog training is you know when you're out there just relaxing having a good time so if you had a terrible day something went wrong you're already going out there with frustration so just keep that in the back of your mind uh, I would say a good time to pack it up is definitely before you blow up on the dog. Uh, it's not, you know, we've all done it, and it never gets you anywhere. I will say dogs are very forgiving. They're so loving. You go, if you stop there, they'll forget about it, and they'll be so happy that you're giving them some food, and they'll be ready the next time you go out. But I will say this, you know, having that trust, you want to think about trust between you and your dog because that is an incredible asset that you can have in your back pocket. Um and every, every time you do something that you probably shouldn't, every time you get over the top with your dog, too angry, uh, or anything that you do that sets yourself back, it's basically, you know, trust is like a bank. You're either depositing or you're taking out. And if you want your investment to grow, you really need to be taking the time and making sure you're putting deposits in, even if you don't feel like it. So uh, if you feel like things are getting, your temper is starting to go up and you feel like things are starting to go really off the rails, that's a good time to stop there before it gets out of hand. Uh, and maybe sometimes instead of just packing it up, just sit down and again, practice hunting. You know, a lot of times you're just sitting there in the blind. Uh, I can't tell you how many times everybody's just sitting there. You're waiting for the birds they are not flying yet. Sit down with your dog, put your arm around it, hang out with it. Have a good time. Even let your dog air out for a minute, then get it back. And if you feel like you're focused, you feel like, okay, I can do this, then get back out and do it. If, you, if you're too frustrated, go home. I promise you, it's not going to set you back. You can you could actually take out of that trust bank before you head home, and that's going to set you back. But if you stop in time before you pull out that deposit that you've been working so hard with on that trust, then – that's a smart move. That's basically just like making a deposit. And if you do enough of that, again, it's gonna that bond's gonna be tight. And that's what you want. You want that tight bond. And it, it's hard though. I can tell you that's you know it's easy to sit here and talk about it. Uh, we've all been there. Uh, and if you haven't, if you don't have a dog yet, and you're thinking about getting one, you're gonna be there. <laughs> so just hang in there and realize that's part of the process. Just take it take it easy. And if you feel too frustrated, like you can't focus, just go home and, and don't sweat it. Come back another day. That that's something that I think I could see that becoming a problem for guys who are in that camp where they get like one or two days a week to train. So they really want to get as much in as they can. And, you know, like I, I, I always equate this stuff to like my, myself. Right. So I'm like, if I'm shooting jump shots in my driveway, like I'm definitely going to end on a go. make, but like if I hit like three or four in a row, <laughs> And I start heating up NBA jam style. I mean, I'm just going to keep going. Right. Then I start missing and I'm like, well, shoot, I got to end on a, a make. So I'm, then I keep missing a bunch. And I, now all that confidence I had is gone because I got to get that one in and I can't do it. Um, so I'm like, man, I, I don't feel real good about myself. So, I mean, I could see guys with, with their dogs being like, Hey, I get an hour on Friday nights after work to, to train it. The session's been going great. Let's just keep going. And then all of a sudden it starts to go off the rails and that person's just like, well, it's been so good. Let's just try to save it. Let's just try to get a little bit more. And then by that point, you know, they might be drawing on that bank you're talking about. And it's like, man, if I had to cut this off like 20 minutes ago, that we might've been further along, you know, at the end of the day, than where you're going to ultimately end up. That's very true. I mean, that's the exact same thing. Cause I feel, I feel that very strongly. I feel like everyone can relate to that. Uh, 
I feel like a lot of times we define success by what it looks like instead of what's actually going on. So if you have a bad rep at the end, that doesn't mean you have a failure at all. So success isn't always defined by what you can see. It's defined by what's actually going on there uh, when, when it comes to the dog. You know, there's progress and there's advancement. Progress doesn't always mean you're you can visibly see advancement advancement is where you're visually visibly being able to see like you're doing longer retreats you can see it happen but sometimes progress is hey my dog made a mistake no biggie we're gonna keep working through it because we make mistakes too and again i would say this err on the side that if your dog's making a mistake most of the time it's going to come back on me the handler that's just how it is it's either i push the dog too quickly push it before but too far beyond what i was ready for some other new variable was introduced. Maybe someone, if you train in public places, maybe someone had a dog in heat there. Now that would be, you know, if you've got a male dog, a dog in heat, or even if for that matter, a female dog, just that can throw them off. They could be interested in, hey, what is this all about? So there's all kinds of small variables that you might have zero idea that were there. They happened before you got there. So I always like to say again, like you said, just take your time. Be patient, and it's not about that last rep. So make sure if you've already had a successful training day and things go wrong, it's not a bad deal. Don't go home feeling sorry for yourself or feeling bad about it. Go home feeling great. Think about the good things that happened. Uh, and it's, uh, you can never go wrong if you do that. I want to go back. You know, we're, we said a few times sit there and, you know, act like you're in a hunting situation. And I I can't help but think, you know, what what is your hunting in Alabama like? Uh, you know, you don't hear too, you don't hear too much about duck hunting in Alabama. So, uh, yeah. and I know myself, I have a lot of time to sit there with my dog. So, uh, you know, how is it down that way? You know, it's kind of like anywhere. If the birds are there, it's great. And if they're not, it, it's not so great. So, uh, and <laughs> we are kind of down here and we're not even really in the, really in the middle of the flyway. So you kind of, but we actually do have a lot of birds, um, you know, I've done some hunting, but it's hard. It's really hard here. You have to really put your work in. I mean, you, you got to work for it in Alabama because there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of waterfowlers here that are, maybe they come from different states. I'm not sure. But if you get out there and you're not, if you're hunting public land and you're not there at 1 a.m., I mean, you're going to be picking third, fourth spot. So you, if you want to get after it, you've got to work for it and really get after it. Unless you're hunting some back slew river somewhere off the beaten path. And you've done your due diligence in the scouting. It's, uh, you know, it can be tough. But I will tell you, if you get on them, I mean, it's it's a barrel burner. You can have a great time here, just like you can at anywhere else. It's, uh, but you got to put the work in. I think that's really the case with all all waterfowl hunting. You got to put the work in. Yeah, uh, I assume in Alabama you can kill more than two mallards. Then what we can, that's what we can kill here. Last I uh, last I looked, I think we were at four mallards, but I can tell you, <laughs> you're probably yeah. not killing four unless you're on them. It's it's going to be wood ducks, gadwall. And you can get on the mallards here and there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Josh, can we can we bring up uh, the question from Theo here? It says, "How careful should we be working slash hunting our pups before they're physically mature?" Given that canine growth plates don't close till 18 to 20 months, is there a danger of injury or hurting a dog's future endurance in the field? You know, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I like to—I really don't like to hunt my dogs before they're a year old. Um, you know, that can—you know—dogs can get hurt any anytime. So anytime you're out there hunting, even if your dog's fully mature, I mean, they can get hurt. It's it's a rough sport when we're out there. It, it can be tough. So the biggest thing is you wouldn't want to be hunting a dog well before it's ready. I mean, we're talking, uh, people do it. You can do it. You can get away with it, but you're not getting the benefit that you really could. If you're, if you're going for the best dog that you can possibly have, if you're hunting that dog at you know seven months old, that's a little early. In my opinion, I, I really prefer to wait till that year plus mark. And especially, I mean, seven months old, if you really think about it and you think about all the work that it takes to put into the training, I will tell you this. I think the reason maybe a lot of people do it is you can push it off very quickly. You can get your dog doing really big things and, and very fast. I mean, you can get your dog doing blinds, hand signals, whistle stop. You could be doing that. If you really busted it, you could be doing that eight, nine months old, somewhere in there. Uh, but the truth is your dog's probably not ready to hunt at that point because like we talked about earlier, it comes down to reps and 
it all boils down to how many reps you can get to have it fully ingrained. You take a young dog out there before it's ready, before you fully prepared it, guns start going off. That dog, you, you see its eyes get a little wide. They get a little wild. It starts breaking. You, that's an early habit that can be developed if you hunt too early is breaking. And then at that point, you've got yourself uh, a lot of work on your hands. So, uh, But as far as safety goes, you know, if your dog's a little over a year old, that's a great time to hunt. You know, A lot of people I know are going to hunt it earlier. The big thing is don't push it too hard. Be be patient. Now, I'm not a vet, so I can't give you, you know, the 100% answer on that your bit your better bet is to ask a vet when hey when was my dog actually healthy enough to hunt but if you were if that were me i would probably do it a little you know a year plus is when i would start looking at hunting is there a window getting away from the safety side of this is there a window in in the dog's development where you know maybe exposing them to uh, gunfire before they're ready or where something could catastrophic happen that could be very detrimental to their long-term development. Um, is there a window in time where that is more likely to happen? And um, if so, like how long is that period where if a guy wants to be cautious and just be sure, uh, what would you say is like that buffer that's like after this point in time, they may have some stumbles, but it's probably not something that's going to have like a, a detrimental impact for the remainder of their hunting career or whatever. Very, very good question. You know, really, it's hard to give you a good a good age window, and the reason why you can give an age window when your dog's six, seven, eight months old, somewhere in there, is because you just haven't had the time to put the training in that it needs to fully have everything that it needs. So the way we like to look at things at Cornerstone is everything is based on skill level. It all boils down to skill level based training, and that means have you introduced your dog the skill sets it needs to be successful? You know, no one wants to go to war if you haven't had training. I mean, if you're just thrown out there. It's not going to go too well. <laughs> so yeah. you, you want to have every tool available to you. You want to have every bit of information you need to know. If you're going to go to war, you want to be prepared. Same thing for a dog. If you're going to take it out there hunting, it needs to be prepared. It needs to have every available possibility to have all the information, all the skill sets conditioned in so that it can be successful. I and mean, the reason I'm saying that is, you know, if, let's just say, hey, I say, you know, eight months old, that's that's the window. Well, let's say somebody has an 18 month old dog and it's had two weeks of training, never heard a, a shotgun before. And you pull out the shotgun, and you start shooting. I mean, that could ruin that dog. So you never yeah. really know. And that's why it's all I really want to tie everything back to that skill level. Have you introduced your dog and solidified the skill sets that it needs to be to be successful because that's your that's your winning formula every time if you want the truth if you want the cold hard truth if you want to know for sure my dog's got this it's ready then you've got to do the skill sets uh, otherwise you are risking it it doesn't mean it's going to happen uh, maybe your dog doesn't reach its full potential maybe you, you do something too early and and maybe that hinders you it slows you down uh, you know, it's really there's very few things that are really just going to be totally detrimental and ruin your dog forever. I mean, gunfire definitely could be one, uh, but there's a lot of things that can slow your progress or really there's, you know, could really hinder you from moving forward and helping that dog to become all that can be. So, uh, as far as getting the dog to where it needs to be skill level based, no matter what the age is. So make sure you've done the right set of skills in the right order and you've had enough times elapsed for it to fully understand the concepts. If you do that, that's the that's the guaranteed formula. You're not going to have problems at that point. You might run into some frustrations, but your dog will accomplish it if you provide your dog the skill sets that it needs to be successful. Great info. Great info. Um, I'm looking over here at, in Vandekamp just made a comment and he said i've been told black labs are better than yellow labs every day of the week so what do you what's your uh, thought on that <laughs> <laughs> it's just a color I mean, it's all preference really uh you know what, whatever color you like that's that's the way to go but uh there's neither one's better than the other or male or female for that matter you definitely have some different tendencies um when it comes to male and female and heat cycles, something to consider when you have a female. But, um, you know, any, any dog that you take, whether, even if it's not a lab, you know, any retriever you take, and for that matter, any type of dog training you're doing, but we stick with waterfowl or retrieving. That's what we focus on. But any dog you take and you invest in and you make the most of, you, you can make it a great dog. So, um, color though, you know, it's a personal preference. I am partial to really, 
I, I love kind of a, a yellow fox fox red top color. I just love that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't beat a black lab either, and they're beautiful. And you can get some stunning stunning labs that are that are black. Let me let me ask you. Um... For any listeners out there that do have puppies, are you up on, you know, when to get them fixed? If they are going to get them fixed, you know, spayed or neutered. But as far as the the bone development or issues further down the line, if you do it too early, you know, I think we've we've talked about it before with Barton, but just to reinforce for people. You know, um, you know, whatever Barton said on that, or really whatever the vet says, I, I never fix any of mine. So I like to leave them the way God made them, and that's the way I like to leave it. But if you're going to do it, it's a lot of great reasons to just do your due diligence. Make sure you're making a good decision on that. So I would not be the best one to answer that. I don't, I leave all mine intact. Yeah. I, my dog was intact for a long time, then he had something else go on. So he had to get neutered like <laughs> and he's 10 years old and i had to neuter him i'm like dude this is the worst so i felt bad for the guy but he ha- had to go down but um yeah. <laughs> i mean this has been probably the quickest hour i can recall on the show honestly it's it's gone by really fast um dan do you have any other questions or anything that you wanted to to run by i don't want to i don't want to keep josh too long no, obviously I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have more questions after the show for people that weren't here tonight but um no, uh, great, great interview. We appreciate your time, and um, we're definitely going to bring you back on. So, yeah, um, you know, yeah, and I, I just want to reinforce to everybody that if you're considering, um, you know, your training options and you're looking at Cornerstone, uh, some people may not realize unless they actually go to the website and check it out. Uh, we're listening to some of the the run, ads that we run on our show here. Um, there's a free preview module there, so you can go and check it out and see, you know, the style and delivery and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's an awesome opportunity for people to just get a feel for what, what the program is going to be like. And if it's something that they feel would be a good fix, uh, or a good fit for them. So, um, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to, to add on that, but, um, you know, we certainly appreciate you joining us and I know it's tough being put under, you know, putting on, putting the spotlight on you, throwing questions at you like this, but, uh, uh, we appreciate you doing it, and I know everybody listening uh, that had questions uh, appreciates us as well. Yeah, hey, I appreciate you guys. All the questions, I appreciate you asking. Really enjoy being on tonight, and uh, you know, if you're thinking about doing it, get after it. You're going to love it 100%. I know a lot of people out there might be on the fence, maybe considering even getting a dog. I can tell you, you know, if you get if you get into this, you might like waterfowl hunting now, but you're you're not. You're gonna love it a, a whole lot more if you have a dog to go with you. You'll go a lot more too. It's it's a lot of fun. But thanks again, Josh and Dan. I appreciate you having me on. It's been a great time. Likewise, we enjoyed it. That's gonna do it for this week. Uh, appreciate Josh Parvin from Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy joining us. Definitely check them out. And um, Dan, that's gonna do it for us this week. Till next time, buddy. See ya. That's going to do it for this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, check out some of our past episodes. And while you're there, leave us a five-star rating and review. It's the best way for like-minded hunters just like you to find our show. Check us out on social media. Check us out over at hpoutdoors.com and anywhere you can find quality podcast content. That's going to do it for this week. Till next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.